All right, let's get to the end of chapter one. Having met Tom, we now meet Daisy. And the introduction to Daisy is done in a stately way. Um, Nick comes into the house and he sees two young women sitting at the end of the room. And we have this gorgeous description of the curtains rising and fluttering. Read that closely and look at the way in which Fitzgerald paints this picture, um, which describes um, this fantastical setting and includes the notion of there being a wedding cake on the ceiling. It's a very, very pretty scene. So we're dazzled by the wealth and the beauty of the Buchanans. Once they start talking, however, we find pretty quickly that Daisy's a bit of an airhead. She says that she's p -p paralyzed with happiness, which is silly. But we do get the message about her having a thrilling voice. And Daisy's voice is a motif that comes back again and again. It had a promise in it. Um, later on in the book, it's a voice that has, is full of money. Daisy's voice is very special. She's also given to outbursts. Um, she cries out ecstatically. She's somebody who is, I think, very clearly an airhead. She is also devoid of maternal instincts. There's really quite a chilling moment where she describes um, straight after giving birth that she has found out she's had a girl and what she says is, I'm glad and I hope she'll be a fool. The best thing a girl can be in this world is a beautiful little fool. Well, that's pretty cynical. So Daisy asserts that she knows everything. She's been everywhere and done everything and she's really sophisticated. But she's deeply cynical and I suspect really quite stupid. Um, she's got uh, no true insight into what's going on and for somebody to say that soon after having a baby is pretty terrifying. We meet Jordan um, and then we have a fairly painful lunch during which Tom spouts nonsense um, concerning a book that he's reading, which is basically a, a white supremacist tract called The Rise of the Coloured Empires, and which talks about the threat that we're under. Tom's not an educated man. What he did at college was play football. He's not a thoughtful person. He's all about physicality and being brutal and hulking, are the terms Daisy uses to describe him. But this sets us up. Um, as we're meeting someone who's got very fixed ideas that the world needs to continue to exist in a way that maintains his position in it. Um, it's also a fairly nasty foreshadowing of stuff that happened that Fitzgerald couldn't have known about, but with the rise of the Third Reich, because Buchanan says that we're Nordics, which is this notion of being Aryan that um, Hitler used in order to assert his own supremacy. Okay, so... At the lunch table, Tom takes a phone call and eventually Daisy gets annoyed enough by it to leave and go inside after him, at which point Jordan informs Nick that Tom has a mistress in New York, some girl in New York, a woman in New York. That's a pretty extraordinary thing to do, to spread gossip um, and be so indiscreet when you've only just met this person for the first time. And it says a lot about the morals of the society itself and also this particular young woman. Um, so they can hear Daisy and Tom arguing inside and then eventually enough time passes that the crimson room bloomed with light which means that the sun is going down and it seems to be time for Nick to decide that he should go home. Um, Look closely at the descriptions of these people in your own time. Look at the adjectives. Words like slender and languid are used to describe Daisy and Jordan. Um, we've got Tom's size. We've got um, the sounds, um, what's happening in the background, the sound of the, the telephone. We hear these things described, but we aren't given a physical description of what they're like. So this is called disembodiment. Um, there's a detachment in the prose. So you need to make note of what is not there. And you'll find throughout the book that things just kind of materialise. You're not really told that there is the sound of a telephone ringing or that somebody's coming and knocking on the door. It's an important technique that a thing is just, it just sort of arrives. Nick goes home. And the chapter closes with him making his first sighting of Gatsby, 
We have met Gatsby by now or heard about him by reputation. Um, Nick says he was confused and a little disgusted as he drove away. Um, it, so it hasn't been a pleasant experience for him either. And he describes the land that he goes through, and it's pretty ordinary, but when he reaches his estate at West Egg, he goes into the shed, puts the car away, and then sits for a while in the yard. And the wind had blown off, leaving a loud, bright night, um, and the silhouette of a moving cat waved across the moonlight. Moving, moonlight, beautiful poetry at nearly every sentence. Fifty feet away, a figure had emerged from the shadow of my neighbour's mansion. Gatsby coming out of the shadows is pretty literally what happens. He just, he's sort of an apparition. He just appears and he stands there. Um, and what he, what Nick sees him do is stretch out his arm in a way which is like a supplicant, somebody asking for something. He reaches toward, towards the single green light, which is a symbol that we must take note of. A single green light, minute and far away, that might have been at the end of a dock. When Nick looks closely at Gatsby, he can see that he's trembling. He's reaching for this green light, which of course is at the end of the dock on the house that Daisy and Tom live in. Nick says that he looked once more for Gatsby, but he'd vanished and I was alone again in the unquiet darkness. That's the way Gatsby does things. He appears, he does something poetically significant. We have a strong image of him standing and reaching towards this green light and then flip, he is gone. 